Um, this next session is um, uh, basically me using program chair's prerogative and being able to put something on the program that I really wanted to do. Uh, so Dave Horsfall here is a member of the RSC team here at Newcastle, and he's gonna he's a um, SSI fellow. His fellowship's based on mental health for RSCs, a subject that is incredibly important, and I uh, decided it should be in plenary. Um, so, Dave, do I need to fill for more time? You're ready to go. <laughs> so, thanks very much, Mark. Um, before the pandemic, um, I worked as a software engineer in industry, and I woke up one day and I realized that I really didn't like my job. Um, I was disillusioned, I wasn't inspired, and despite trying, I couldn't with any authenticity say that I believed in the services that I was building. Importantly, I had a little girl that I wanted to inspire um, with a positive message about technology and the future. So I started looking for jobs and I saw a job advert for a research software engineer at Newcastle University. At first, I obviously dismissed it out of hand because the pay was naff, but then <laughs> my wife sent me the same job advert again the next week and I actually read the job description and I thought, you know what? That actually sounds really interesting. Um, ultimately, I ended up joining the ROC team at Newcastle University, and it was a complete leap of faith for me because I didn't know anything about the ROC movement. Um, but I was excited about returning to academia, and I just had a really good feeling about it. I started work on the 30th of March 2020, which was just a couple of days into the first national lockdown. I'm not sure about your place, but lockdowns in my house were a complete roller coaster. Um, I had some pretty low points uh, during the pandemic, and particularly lockdowns, and some really good times too. But one thing that I did learn is that two parents uh, cannot teach and homeschool at the same time um, and do their work, as evidenced here quite nicely by my wife. Um, so despite being broadsided by the pandemic, I absolutely love working as an RSE. I get to work in several really inspiring, genuinely diverse teams. I'm fortunate enough to work on really exciting science, and I get to bring all of my industry best practice and then apply it in an environment where it's appreciated and has a really good impact. I also get exposure to the research software community which is full of really talented, kind people that are collaborating and achieving and carving out this entirely new academic ecosystem for us. So I wanted to ask all of you, what one word would you use to describe as working uh, in your role as an RSE? So throughout this presentation, I'm going to be using an interactive um, presentation software called Menti. Uh, Mentimeter, so you can go to menti.com and enter the code at the top of uh, the screen there, 16161721. And you'll be able to follow along with my slides and um, engage with any questions that I'm asking. So fulfilling seems to be centralized there, which is quite good. Uh, this is just a bit of an icebreaker, just to make sure everyone can get onto the system and it's working. So I've talked about some of the good things for my motivation to go to work, but it, is, it isn't all positive. I did find the isolation of the pandemic really hard. Perhaps it, my situation was unique because I had just started uh, and I was trying to establish new relationships um, but I was just really desperate to be around other people. And I was excited about being on campus, on a busy, vibrant um, uh, environment. Uh, and I was really sad that when that was taken away from me. The act of coding itself is a solitary activity. Uh, when our brain is focused on syntax and our fingers are typing, we're not emotionally connected with anyone. And popular culture gives uh, developers a stereotype of being socially awkward, but actually uh, developers require very good social skills. We need to discuss solutions and system designs with our colleagues, mentor junior developers, and report to managers. 
Um, the pandemic has permanently changed the culture in our teams, and at times I still find it really hard to feel connected with my colleagues. When I was a physics student, I suffered really badly with imposter syndrome. It wasn't something that I realized at the time, but since returning to academia in the RSE role, it's something much easier for me to recognize. Imposter syndrome is loosely defined um, as the idea that you've only succeeded due to luck and not because of your talent or qualifications. And developers um, can frequently dwell on the knowledge and languages that they don't know. This is especially true as an RSE because we frequently switch between projects where we might know very little about the scientific domain that we're supporting. My first few months in this job were spent sat in meetings with an internal monologue of, am I supposed to know what this person is talking about? <laughs> we are expected to deal with really complex science that other people have spent a lifetime studying. And on top of that, we're often responsible for the whole software life cycle from design through to deployment. We can't know everything and we're not supposed to. That's why we work in teams and anyone who makes you feel otherwise is not your friend. It took me a long time to come up with strategies to deal with this and I try to separate fact uh, from feelings. There are times that I feel stupid and it happens from everyone. It happens to everyone from time to time, but just realize uh, that because you're feeling stupid, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are. Uh, we're all qualified to do our jobs because we were selected through a recruitment process. Sometimes I'm so busy uh, and I've been forced to make so many decision decisions that I grind to a complete cognitive standstill. In the past, programming was an activity based on assembling low level instructions um, from, a, from a small number of structures like loops and conditional statements. And even the design was generally very simple. But today, programmers work at a much higher level of abstraction, applying design patterns, reusing sophisticated class libraries, and extending powerful frameworks. Besides writing new code, um, RSEs are often expected to perform parallel tasks like refactoring and writing tests. The consequence is that we make very important decisions at each step of our, um, of our work, but research shows that people who are required to make many decisions become mentally exhausted until they reach the point where they can no longer make effective decisions. And this problem of decision fatigue is particularly important when we need to make trade-offs where a design decision uh, requires evaluating different options and analyzing their advantages and disadvantages. I sometimes find myself um, taking the option that seems to present the least amount of friction, and it leads to cryptic and brittle code that no one else can understand. Like many in academia, uh, I'm now on a fixed term employment contract. I have two kids and a mortgage that ends next year. Um, interest rates are going up, um, inflation is going up, and the cost of living crisis is gonna bite really hard this year. Financial pressures, job security, thinking about opportunities for career progression are a constant underlying worry. All of the good things and all of the bad things that I've spoken about contribute to my state of mental health. It's not a sign of weakness. Sometimes I feel good and sometimes I feel bad. Our mental health indicates how we're able to cope with the stresses of daily life it affects how we think and feel and act, and it's just part of being human. So I wanted to ask all of you, what factors contribute to poor mental health in your role as an RSE? So short-term contracts, lack of time and workload and overwork, job security, too many projects, stress, decision-making, too many projects, Tories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, workload, isolation, high expectations, self-expectations. Burnout, tight deadlines, context switching. These are all themes that have emerged 
very frequently when I've spoken about mental health in the past. I'm, there's, there's going to be loads of respondents. There's 125 already posted. Um, just to let you know, I'll make sure that these slides with all of the responses from everyone are made available um, afterwards for people to review. And I have actually just suggested a breakout session focusing around mental health if you want to do a bit of a debrief on this session as well at some point during the conference. So um, think of mental health as a continuum which we're constantly moving up and down um, based on what's happening in our lives. Your mental health will have a huge impact on your performance and your motivation at work and therefore also your successes. So thinking about it proactively now will help you develop good habits and new strategies to deal with potential pressures, keeping you on the, the healthy end of this, con uh, this continuum. Mental health is not an interchangeable term with mental illness. If someone has been living with very bad mental health for a long time and they reach out for professional support, they might get a diagnosis of a mental illness. And then with support and ongoing treatment, they can live happy and healthy lives with good mental health on the positive end of this scale. By being better educated and aware of this subject, it will give you a deeper understanding of the experiences of other people on your team. Being more compassionate and kind might be a huge unspoken personal kindness to someone who has been silently living with a mental health condition. And it's really important for everyone on a team, but particularly those who manage projects or people, to never assume that they understand how someone else is feeling uh, based on their own experiences. So, by the way, a quick introduction. My name is Dave and I work as an RSE. As Mark said, I'm also a Software Sustainability Institute fellow who advocates for mental health specifically in the RSE community. Uh, I was awarded a fellowship in 2021 and I have two very simple aims. I want to raise awareness uh, by doing talks like this and to reduce the stigma associated with talking about it. Um, I don't want to give the impression that I'm an expert uh, or a trained mental health professional. I'm just someone from the community who is trying to start this conversation. So I wanted to ask everyone, would you feel comfortable talking about mental health with your supervisor? So thanks very much. We seem to have settled on something there. There's still a lot of people in the room that don't feel comfortable uh, talking about this subject um, with their land manager or supervisor. In 2017, uh, the government commissioned Thriving at Work report uncovered a crisis in Britain's workplace. <laughs> it found that people with mental health problems felt stigmatized and they weren't getting the support that they needed and it found that employers um, were unsure how to provide adequate support and were collectively losing billions as a result. Just 13% of people felt able to disclose a mental health issue to their line manager. So it seems that we're doing better than that, which is great. PhD candidates report concerns about anxiety at significantly higher levels than in undergraduates. And Nature's 2019 PhD survey found that over a third of respondents had sought help for anxiety or depression related to their studies. And Stack Overflow's 2022 developer survey with participation from over 70,000 developers found that 22% of respondents reported having some type of mental health issue. These studies um, give us insights into the prevalence of mental health problems in adjacent industries, but are they indicative of our RSE community? I've spoken to several groups of RSEs over the last 12, 18 months, and anecdotally, I do see trends emerging. But wouldn't it be useful if we could survey our community to get an accurate snapshot of mental health? 
Uh, well, I've been working really hard and I'm really pleased to launch that survey uh, this week. Yay! <laughs> I know that we've all got survey fatigue, but I'm going to argue that this one is really important and could give us some really valuable information about the health of the UK uh, workforce. The survey takes uh, between uh, six and 12 minutes to complete, depending on your answers. Um, so the survey could really drive meaningful, uh, lasting change in our community. Uh, so please scan the QR code and take a few minutes to complete it. There'll hopefully be survey invites landing in your inboxes over the next few weeks as well to remind you. So please share it with your teams and any other RSEs uh, that you know. So one thing that I found uh, since talking to the community is that lots of people really want to talk about stress and high workload and they have a lot to say, but they very rarely get asked. So I wanted to perform a kind of little mental health check-in uh, just to see how everyone's feeling at the moment. So please indicate whether you strongly disagree or strongly agree with these statements. So I'm happy at work. I feel on top of my workload and uh, I feel connected with my colleagues. So I'm really pleased that happy at work is actually really positive. And I think we're, we're doing pretty well as well with connection with colleagues. There's a much wider spread for uh, filling on top of workload, which is kind of expected. I think it's really important that we recognize that there are people in this room that really do not feel on top of their workload at all. And some that um, don't feel connected with colleagues either. So I want to talk about the idea of self-care or preventative measures. What actions can we take to stay mentally healthy? By talking with other people and sharing our own experience of coping with stress and high workload, we can normalize the conversation about working um, about um, mental health in our teams. I don't have a lot of time today, so I've picked out just a couple of points uh, to discuss that seem to have connected with other people. Have you ever considered yoga? <laughs> From my experience, suggesting uh, that a stressed out software engineer should go and do yoga might result with a punch in the face. Um, the truth is that yoga can really help reduce stress, but it can also sound very disingenuous when offered as a lazy solution from employers to staff who are under immense pressure. Research has a culture might result in you having very high expectations of yourself and feel that other people have very high expectations too. Acknowledge your limits and set realistic expectations. It's easy to get swept away as the deadlines pile up, but take a few moments to think about whether a particular expectation you have is realistic. And if it isn't, then change it to something more reasonable. And if you have an unrealistically heavy workload, then admitting that to yourself is the first step to getting the situation back under control. And practice self-compassion. We need to treat ourselves with kindness and be aware of when we are unduly self-critical, hard or punitive. If you're not feeling good or you've made a mistake, then notice when you're speaking to yourself using harsh language and change those internal messages to something more gentle and accepting. Basically, just treat yourself as you would a friend. I still sometimes berate myself for really small mistakes and use language that I would never dream of doing with someone else. And it's not helpful or productive. I've talked about factors that can cause poor mental health, working as an RSE. By being proactive and addressing these through self-care, it can help avoid the buildup of stress that can lead to anxiety or depression. So when is self-care not enough? The most common mental health difficulties are anxiety and depression. Everyone gets worried or feels down from time to time. 
This is part of being human and is usually a response to a specific situation. It's important to recognize when ordinary anxiety or low mood starts to develop into an anxiety disorder or clinical depression and take steps to address that sooner rather than later. Sadly, it's often not until things reach a crisis point that it's recognized that someone has been having problems with their mental health. A certain amount of worry or anxiety is inevitable and it's an appropriate human response to certain situations like a real or perceived threat. Some people are more prone to worry than others and this becomes a disorder when the symptoms are prolonged, are very difficult to contain, spiral out of proportion or get in the way of everyday functioning. Most of us will have periods of low mood um, or sadness at some time and usually we can recognize where these sad or pessimistic thoughts and feelings are coming from and we know that they will pass eventually. When they are long lasting or when they keep returning for no particular reason, then this might be a sign that we're experiencing depression. And depression can be really hard to spot, particularly in men, and it can be masked as anger, irritability, or increased risk-taking. The stress response is really useful to get you through short-lived emergency situations. It can help you rise to the occasion if you have a tight deadline to meet or run away from tigers in the jungle. It becomes a problem uh, when the stress you are under is prolonged and long lasting. And if you fail to recognize when your stress levels are becoming unmanageably high and don't take steps to address this, then you may fall into burnout. It's a state of emotional, physical and mental exhaustion that leaves us feeling helpless, disillusioned and emotionally drained. Burnout saps your energy, leaving you feeling increasingly hopeless and resentful. And if you are experiencing burnout, it's really important to reach out and speak to people, but not other negative burnt out colleagues. It might be necessary for you to take a break from work to recharge your batteries. And this is the responsible thing to do and should not be having seen as failed in some way. Sadly, there's still a lot of shame in needing to take some time out to take care of your mental health. So now I wanted to ask who or which of you have experience of one of these mental health conditions. So you can select from the ones that I've discussed, depression, anxiety, burnout, or you can let us know that you've experienced some other mental health condition as well. And of course, you can let us know that you have no experience of these. You can only select one option. So please um, select the one that you feel has had the most impact on your life. <clears throat> so when I started these talks, this slide really shocked me, <laughs> but it doesn't shock me anymore. So this is um, pretty consistent with um, other talks that I've done. And um, it really shows the prevalence of mental health issues in our community, or at least people who are assessing themselves as having some kind of experience with these conditions, and that's really important. In 2017, um, a close friend took their own life at the age of 35. Um, I met John at Durham University uh, when we were both undergraduates. He was an extremely intelligent and um, successful man one of the very difficult things about grief is coming to terms with the fact that you'll never be able to ask questions or understand why or what happened or have any kind of dialogue. We were a very close group of friends, um, but John had previously sought professional help for anxiety and he didn't feel able to share that with us. I can only assume that he felt ashamed um, of the problems that he was having, but the truth is I'll never actually really know. Suicide is a, a serious public health problem in the UK, and it may have affected several of you in this room. There were 6,248 registered suicides in the UK in 2020, which is 17 people each day that can't see any other way out. Uh, and males remain 
almost three times as likely to die by suicide than females. So my motivation for advocating for mental health isn't necessarily as dramatic as saving lives. If John was unable to speak openly about this with close friends, like what chance did he have at work? I have a very strong emotional reaction when I think about how John felt at the end of his life. And by reducing the stigma and making people realize that there isn't any shame in mental illness, then perhaps we can create an environment where people can talk freely and access the support that's available that's going to help them. Uh, and if just one person in our community is confident enough to speak up and get the help that's available to them, then that's enough for me. So I didn't know what to expect when I started talking about this, and I'm really pleased to say that I've experienced nothing but support and encouragement. I'd like to thank the Software Sustainability Institute and the uh, Society of RSE for their help and support, and the growing number of individuals in the community who are getting involved as well. There are events in the pipeline uh, with a focus on mental health. There's a Coding Confessions panel at this conference on Thursday at 11 o'clock. So Coding Confessions is a concept that grew out of a collaborations hack day, and the idea is that developers confess their coding sins about mistakes that they've made, and it's really great for normalizing failure uh, and addressing imposter syndrome. The next research software camp, which will run the week starting the 7th of November, uh, will focus exclusively on mental health and will be a series of um, online uh, events and workshops. And then next year's collaboration workshop will also focus on mental health uh, with a theme of sustainable career development in research software looking after your software, your career, and yourself. So I'm trying to build a network of people in the community who are interested or just want to stay up to date um, with the advocacy that I'm doing. Uh, if you'd like to join the mailing list, please scan the QR code. I'm particularly interested to hear from anyone who's had any training in mental health, such as mental health first aid. Um, but please feel free to come up to me during the conference as well, or you can email me um, afterwards. Let's talk more about mental health. Thanks very much. So I think we can take some Slido questions. I'll see if I can take this off. Will the questions just appear when, OK. If anyone has any questions uh, in the room um, or anything to, to post uh, to Slido, then um, I'd be happy to take a, a, a few before we move on. So thank you very much for sharing your experience. No question, just want to say thanks for highlighting these issues. Any tips on how a team culture can foster mental health awareness? So this is a really interesting question. From my experience, um, to, to foster a good culture around mental health, um, you obviously need people on the team who are really invested in this subject. Um, I think the first step is creating an environment where people feel that they can, they can share things that aren't always positive um, about themselves and know that they're not going to feel judged when they do so. Um, there's people in the community that I'm working with and I'm excited about. Um, we want to create a working group. I mean, if you're interested in that, join the mailing list. And the idea of the working group is that we will share resources specifically for our community across teams uh, and groups in the UK um, so that we can um, kind of share our experiences and have resources available to help foster this type of culture. Something that's really interesting that's come up um, quite a few times already in this conference is um, this, this idea around kind of what our identity is and I really want to in addition to kind of uh, instilling this 
idea of quality and expertise around research software engineering, um, make sure we have a really good um, kind of well-being culture as well, instead of just this race to the bottom, because there's many, many systemic structural problems around well-being in academia. I think that we have a unique opportunity to build our ROC community in a, maybe a different direction. We can't change real structural um, problems in academia, but we can try to go in a different direction. So what are you supposed to do if you have a more stigmatized mental health condition than depression or anxiety? Um, that's also a very good question and quite difficult to answer without specifics. And one thing that I'm trying to do better in these situations is fall back onto my kind of caveat of not being an expert in this. Um, so maybe I, I'm not entirely sure. And again, I can't answer that without the, the details um, of what the condition is. Um, I'm sorry, I don't feel that that's a very good response. Um, but I think trying to educate other people in your team around the condition and, and helping them understand some of the challenges that you face might be a good place to start. What ways can you approach talking to your supervisors about chronic mental health dis disorders without it negatively affecting their perception of you and your actions? So the um, Thriving at Work report touched quite a lot on this. People don't want to disclose mental health problems because they think it's going to negatively impact their um, opportunities at work. Um, I think the problem, and particularly in academia, maybe in research software engineering, is that people who have carved out opportunities for themselves and built teams around themselves um, are focused on technicalities, and on software engineering and might not have a lot of training around mental health. And so it has to be a two-way relationship where you possibly, um, unfortunately, have to uh, provide information about the conditions that you're having um, and help the person understand that um, having a mental health disorder doesn't necessarily mean that you're bad at your job. That's really important. And this is one of the things around diversity and inclusion just because you have a mental health illness doesn't mean that you can't do your job. And in fact, it might bring a new perspective into the team that no one else can. And those can actually be really positive things as well. So I won't take any more questions, but please do come up and speak to me afterwards. Um, I'd invite Peter to come up and stop preparing. I'm going to introduce Peter. So Peter Schmidt is going to be performing a live podcast today. Um, Peter and I have um, done a podcast together on mental health. So if you go to the Code for Thought website, you can actually listen to that. And it was a really interesting uh, and good podcast session. Um, but I'll hand over to Peter. Thanks very much.